from uh, University of uh, Rochester. Uh, thanks for the organizers to uh, allow me to give this, uh, give this talk. Um, I want to say that just a couple of disclaimers. The level of details that I'm going to give in this talk is not going to be uh, as much as compared to the other talks we have seen uh, so far. Uh, just because if I get into those details, then uh, I'm going to take way longer time. And I want to sort of get into um, the main idea behind like constructing zero-knowledge proofs from uh, multi-party uh, computation. All right. So first, I'm going to give some motivating slides uh, on, uh, on zero-knowledge. And uh, well, as of today, I mean, everyone is interested in bitcoins and cryptocurrencies and blockchains. And zero-knowledge fit right in um, as a very useful primitive in, uh, in this space. And I'm going to take one aspect to motivate um, zero knowledge proofs. This is about anonymity. Now, this was one of the reasons why cryptocurrencies did get popular, get, did get popular because uh, of the promise of uh, anonymity. But as we know, classical bitcoins, they are not uh, anonymous. In fact, there are companies that do linkage analysis to uh, de-anonymize uh, the Bitcoin uh, blockchain. But you know, soon after, you know, the right people started attempting on getting anonymity and using cryptography, one can fix this problem uh, well. And there were a couple of works. What I'm going to focus on, at least not focus on, but uh, what's more relevant is the Zcash uh, cryptocurrency that employed zero knowledge proofs for um, uh, for anonymity. So I'm going to sort of give you a very very simplified view of this thing. Um, if you see the slide, it's not like you're going to you'd be able to start the next company to do zero knowledge. There's a lot of uh, uh, subtle things that needs to be taken care of to really get anonymity. You should ask Alessandro; he has experience from the Zcash to actually uh, get this into practice. But I sort of want to just motivate zero knowledge proofs. Okay, so for me, Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency where I'm going to think of a unit of currency is uh, a ciphertext. And it is identified by a key who owns the uh, uh, the person who has the key owns the uh, uh, owns the coin, and the serial number identifies this coin. And for me, the blockchain is going to be a list of ciphertexts and transactions. Okay. So what do we want in such a framework for anonymity? You want to have a nice mechanism for transferring money from one person to another. In particular, what you want is a mechanism for one party who is owning the coin to prove to another party that it owns the coin. Okay? Like I'm I will be able to pay to you only if I own the coin. Okay? So we want a mechanism that will allow one party, let's say the coin owner, to reveal this serial number and say that I own this coin. Okay? Now, in the classical Bitcoin framework, I can just you know, reveal the key or you know, show other mechanism and point to a, uh, in this list and say, this is where I got my money from. Okay? And this is exactly what caused the, uh, the vulnerability because I can link transactions. Okay? So I want to have a proof that I can show to someone that I have a key and a ciphertext that this ciphertext is somewhere in the list of transactions that you see thus far in the blockchain. And this equation holds that the ciphertext is the encryption of the serial number under this key. This exactly proves that I own this coin. So I want a mechanism where one party can prove such a statement to another party while hiding everything else. Okay. In particular, you want a proof that doesn't reveal where uh, my ciphertext is in this list of transactions. I'm going to give a second example. And um, here you can think about, we all access websites on our, uh, on our browser. How do we authenticate that this is a legitimate uh, website? This happens to be through a mechanism called uh, certificates. You get a certificate, a digital certificate from a certi certificate authority. And you know, whenever you load this on your browser, you get this information and you verify you load this on your browser only if you have a valid certificate. And this has been studied like 
really extensively in cryptography. It has like just this basic mechanism, has a lot of vulnerabilities when the certificate authority is corrupted or there are uh, you know, man in the middle attacks and so forth. So there has been a, a drive to get some form of certificate transparency, a mechanism by which the browser can validate if there are bad certificates as well as report that these websites are in fact bad. Okay? And the idea is that there is a public log that is maintained that the certificate authority, every time it issues a certificate, should log this in the log and get sort of a timestamp from this audit log. And this timestamp is passed along uh, with the certificate, and the browser will check against this public log um, that such a certificate exists or not. And if it doesn't, it can report saying that this is a bad website. Okay? And this is actually a real thing. The certificate transparency is a project that Google is involved in. There are other companies that are involved in maintaining such a public log. Now, the problem in this picture is that when my browser recognizes that there is some website which has an issue, I need to report it. But by definition, if I have to report this, I have to reveal the website I was browsing. Now, there are obvious reasons that I want to keep my uh, website uh, that I'm accessing private. But you can also think of this as if you are in a company and you're viewing some subdomain uh, inside your company, you don't want to reveal it. Okay? You might not even want other people to know such uh, a website. Okay? So here, what do we want? We want a mechanism for the browser to show that there is this certificate issued by some certificate authority that is not in this public audit log. And you want to do this without <coughs> revealing, in particular, the website that you are accessing. Okay? So here are two motivating examples. There are many, many applications of zero knowledge. I just picked two of these. So what's common between these two things? Well, in general, you want a mechanism that will allow you to prove some form of compliance, or you can think of here as a predicate, on sensitive information while keeping the sensitive information private. Okay? So we all know what is the predicate that we want to prove, but there is some sensitive information that goes into this predicate that we want to hide, but still convince that this sen sensitive information is compliant. Okay? And the tool that we want to use here is zero-knowledge proofs introduced by uh, Gulwasar, Mikali, and Rakoff in 85. I'm going to go into explaining what are zero-knowledge proofs and show some constructions of how we are going to uh, do it. And if I have some time in the end, I will connect it to uh, probabilistically checkable proofs that you've been seeing uh, the last couple of days. Again, as I said, disclaimer, it's high level. I'm not going into the details. So for me, a proof system satisfies these three properties. True assertions can be proved, false assertions cannot be proved, and it needs to be easily verifiable. Okay? If you didn't have the third condition, then proof systems don't make sense because I can just ask you to do it yourself to check whether some statement is true or false. And for our purposes here, easily verified, at least from a computer science perspective, we're going to say it needs to be verifiable in probabilistic polynomial time. So, in this, uh, in this aspect, what do zero-knowledge proofs do? Well, I want to say one way to view it is it is sort of a compiler that takes proofs that you can verify with private information and transform it into proofs that helps you verify the same thing without the private information. Okay? So slightly more formally, you should think of it as an interaction between a prover and a verifier where the prover has some statement that it wants to prove to uh, the verifier. And just to be, you know, to make the discussion simple, you can think of X as some NP statement. Okay? And it needs to satisfy three properties. Completeness, which says that P can convince, the prover can convince the verifier whenever the statement is true, which means that it has, say, a valid NP witness, for example. Soundness says that no prover should be able to convince the verifier if X is not true. Okay. Here again, there are many variants, some of which that uh, uh, Alessandro told in the morning. You can, have, you can ask that no unbounded prover or no computationally bounded prover uh, can uh, convince the verifier if X is not true, and you get proofs or arguments uh, uh, correspondingly. 
And the last thing, zero knowledge, says that no efficient verifier can learn anything more than the validity of the statement. Okay? And we've already seen completeness and soundness over the past two days. What I want to focus on is the zero knowledge property. So first, let me just give you a, a classical example on one of the first zero knowledge proofs for um, the statement of graph isomorphism. So here, what do we have? Both the prover and the verifier have uh, as input the um, have two graphs. And the prover wants to convince the verifier that these two graphs are isomorphic. So let's say that the prover has this witness that demonstrates that these two graphs are isomorphic. A simple way to convince would be for the prover to just simply give, hand over this uh, uh, isomorphism that shows the mapping of vertices from one to another, and the verifier will be convinced. But such a proof system is not zero knowledge. In particular, it reveals a lot of information about this isomorphism itself between uh, the two graphs. So here, we're going to come up with an interactive system which is sort of going to hide this isomorphism between the graphs G0 and G1. So how does this protocol proceed? The first step, the prover is going to pick, say, G0 and randomly permute the vertices over here to get a new graph H. Okay. So when I say randomly permute, just think of it as relabeling the vertices uh, of the graph by applying a random permutation. Okay. And it constructs this graph H, gives it to the verifier. Now the verifier is going to challenge 0 or 1. Depending on what challenge the verifier gives, the prover needs to demonstrate that either G0 is isomorphic to H or G1 is isomorphic to H. Okay. So let's quickly see why this is complete uh, sound and um, zero knowledge. So it's complete because an honest prover that has the isomorphism from G0 to G1 <laughs> will always be able to answer, uh, give the right answer in the third round. Because the prover actually constructed H, let's say, from G0. If the challenge was 0, then it can just give this isomorphism. But if the challenge was 1, it needs to get the isomorphism from G1. But this is easy because it knows the isomorphism from G0 to G1. So it can compose the isomorphism from H to G0 and G0 to G1 and get the isomorphism between uh, H and G1. Okay? So this protocol is complete in that the prover can always convince the verifier when it knows the isomorphism between G0 and G1. Soundness, on the other hand, can be easily argued by observing that no matter what H the prover gives to the verifier, it can be isomorphic to at most one of the two graphs. Because if it was isomorphic to both graphs, they were isomorphic to begin with. So since it can be isomorphic to at most one of the two graphs, there is always a challenge on which it's going to fail. So the soundness of this uh, proof system is at least a half. Okay. Now, Zero knowledge, I'm going to sort of hand wave here to see that what, did the, what does the verifier learn in this uh, uh, computation? Well, in an interaction over here, it either learns an isomorphism between G0 and some random graph H, or it learns an isomorphism between G1 and a random graph H. This is what it sees in an interaction with the prover. And this reveals like, as you can see, I mean, again, I'm hand waving, it doesn't reveal any explicit connection between uh, G0 and G1 itself. Okay? This can be formally argued. I want to now get into how does one formally define uh, zero knowledge proofs. So, again, little high level, but this is sort of the formal definition of a zero knowledge proof system. You're going to say that an interactive proof system is zero knowledge if for every efficient verifier, and an efficient verifier is captured by probabilistic polynomial time Turing machine. For every efficient verifier, there is an efficient or probabilistic polynomial time simulator that can simulate the view of the verifier against the prover. So let's see a little more carefully what this means. So what happens in a real interaction? Well, the verifier exchanges messages with the prover and you know might also toss coins in this in, in the process now the zero knowledge definition wants to capture the fact that these things that the verifier receives during the interaction doesn't carry any information okay it doesn't carry any information beyond the fact that 
this statement is true. In the case of graph isomorphism, you want to say that the messages don't carry any more information beyond the fact that these two graphs are uh, isomorphic. Okay? So, to show that such a thing is zero knowledge, you construct a simulator that can generate something that looks like this. And in particular, it needs to do this without knowing the witness. Okay? This seems, uh, this seems funny, but if we can show that for every verifier there is a simulator that can generate this that looks like what it would see in uh, a real interaction with the prover, then we can conclude that whatever the verifier says it's going to learn from this, it could have as well learn it, learned from the simulator's output. Okay? Again, this can be mathematically formalized. I'm not getting into this over here. One needs to define these are actually, they are not, you know, you cannot just say this is equal to this. This is actually a distribution, and you need to sort of compare two distributions and talk about what does it mean to say that uh, two distributions are the same or indistinguishable. Okay? So, but this is the definition of zero knowledge. It says that for every verifier, that claims to say that, look, I learned something during an interaction with the prover, there is a simulator that could have generated the same view. Okay, and here by view of the verifier, I'm talking about what the verifier sees during the interaction with an honest prover. So, the rationale again, as I said before, behind this definition is that the verifier learns nothing beyond what it could have learned on its own. Okay? And here, when we say that what the verifier itself, we are going to restrict ourselves to you know, whatever uh, it can learn in probabilistic polynomial time. Now, I should do it here. So, you should imagine here that how do you convince yourself that this proof system is zero knowledge? The idea is that if a malicious verifier is interacting with the prover and it's trying to claim that, look, your proof system is actually revealing more than what it should be, then you imagine this verifier could run, you can imagine another party or the verifier itself running the simulator and producing these messages and learning the same information. And here, the verifier learned this information without the prover, in particular without the witness. So it learned that information without um, the sensitive information, at least what we think of, that the prover had. Okay? And here there is sort of a subtle point when we say that we want to say that the verifier does not learn anything more than uh, the validity of the statement here. Uh, one needs to be careful. There are some simple things that you can always learn from uh, from your statement. It's not like zero knowledge protects against everything that you can learn from a proof system. It can only protect against things that are not free. And what is free? Free is probabilistic polynomial time computation. Anything that I can learn from the statement in probabilistic polynomial time is for free. It's only things beyond probabilistic polynomial time that we can protect against zero knowledge. Okay. And the, the problem graph isomorphism is a good instance because we don't know whether graph isomorphism can be done in polynomial time. Okay? So th it, is, it is meaningful to ask to protect the isomorphism in your interactive proof system. Everyone with me so far? Okay. So zero knowledge proofs, again, a, a little bit uh, um, motivation slide here is that Zero knowledge proofs, they sort of introduced and was the cornerstone of modern definitions of security. It introduced the simulation paradigm that helps you argue and define security of cryptographic primitives. Not just that, it also, the, the ways in which you, have, you prove an interactive proof uh, is zero knowledge also provided techniques to prove other primitives are secure. In particular, the simulation paradigm through rewinding, which I won't get into, was an important contribution towards developing cryptographic primitives. And of course, zero knowledge is uh, you know, a cryptographic building block. We've known since the 80s, but now you know, people are trying to use this as much as uh, possible. 
So what can you prove using zero knowledge? I gave you a simple proof system um, for graph isomorphism. But graph isomorphism, again, we don't know if it is uh, NP complete, meaning can it be used to prove any NP statement? In fact, we have evidence to show that it might not be NP complete. But what can we prove using zero knowledge? Well, soon after zero knowledge proofs were uh, introduced, the work of um, Gorak, Mikali, and Vigdorsen showed that you can prove zero knowledge proofs for all of NP. Okay? And the, the theorem statement basically says that if you have this cryptographic object that we call bit commitments, then you can construct a zero knowledge proof for all of NP. And I'm going to show this proof in a, in a, in a few slides. But just a, a quick word about bit commitments. Whenever I say commitments, just for a mental note, you can think of it as just using some sort of collision resistant hash function on uh, whatever message I'm talking about. But bit commitments formally are sort of a digital equivalent of a sealed envelope. It helps one person to commit to some information digitally to another person in such a way that I can transform my message to the string that will not reveal anything about the message. But at a later point of time, when the person says, tell me what you committed, I cannot change it. So it satisfies two properties. One is hiding, which says that I can transform my message into this string that hides my message. And it is also binding in that at a later point of time, if the person who had the string asks me, tell me what I committed, I cannot change my mind about it. Okay, so this is this property is called binding. So if I have a bit commitment scheme, then I can get zero knowledge proofs for all of NP. In fact, you can have bit commitment, uh, these hiding and binding properties, um, one of these two properties can also be satisfied against, say, an unbounded adversary. So, but what can you, like, so this is good, but how do you, what do you need to construct um, bit commitment schemes? So it's a cryptographic object, and it was shown in a sequence of works after that, that one-way functions, which is sort of the minimal assumption that you need for cryptography, is enough to construct a bit commitment. So now we know that just one-way functions are sufficient to construct zero-knowledge proofs for all of NP. Okay? So one can ask, you know, I, I say that this is the smallest sort of thing primitive that we want in, uh, in, in cryptography. Can we do better? Well, actually, there is a lower bound that sort of says that if you have zero-knowledge proofs for certain languages, like hard on the average languages, then it implies some form of one-way functions. So in some sense, one-way function is sort of the minimal thing that we need to construct zero-knowledge proofs. Okay? So for the rest of the talk, I am going to focus on zero-knowledge proofs for, for NP, but I do want to point out that you can do zero-knowledge proofs for beyond NP. In fact, it was shown that everything provable is provable in zero knowledge, meaning anything that has an interactive proof system, as we saw yesterday that all of PSpace has an interactive proof system, any language that has an interactive proof system can be compiled into a proof system that is additionally zero knowledge. Again, beautiful works. I encourage all of you to like go and read the, uh, read the classics. Um, but today, we are going to sort of focus on zero knowledge for all of NP. So first, I'm going to talk about the classical, uh, uh, classical construction of zero knowledge. So we saw this problem. Prahlad introduced the problem of graph three coloring. We know graph three coloring is an NP complete problem. I'm going to give you a zero knowledge proof system um, for graph three coloring and then do the, the normal computer science -y thing to say that everything in NP can be reduced in graph three coloring, so I'm done. Okay? So what do we want to do in, in, in graph three coloring? Here we have a scenario where both the prover and the verifier have uh, a graph as input, and the prover additionally has a three coloring of this graph. And the prover wants to convince to the verifier that it has a three coloring of this graph. Okay, so I'm going to give you the proof system and uh, argue why it is uh, zero knowledge. And as I mentioned before, I will need this cryptographic object called um, commitments. 
So what does the prover have? So the common statement that the prover and the verifier have is the graph. The prover additionally has a witness that it is trying to protect, which will be the coloring of the graph. OK, in the first step, what's the prover going to do? Well, the prover is going to permute the coloring of the graph. It has one kind of like three coloring of this graph. It's just going to relabel these colorings, say, you know, gray to black, black to gray, and keep red uh, unchanged. And I'm going to, at the end of this, I'm going to ask you why this permuting uh, is, uh, is important, but uh, let's go on with the protocol. So in the first step, the prover takes the graph, takes its coloring, and just does uh, a relabeling of this uh, coloring. Then the prover is going to um, commit to the coloring of each of the nodes of the graph and send it to the verifier. Okay? I didn't go into the details of how a commitment is constructed from one-way functions so forth. There are interactive protocols, there are non-interactive protocols, but for here, just imagine it's easier to think about a non-interactive commitment scheme, meaning the prover can take each string that it wants to commit and convert it to like a string that will serve as the commitment for that message or string. Okay, so the prover takes this relabeled colors of the graph, commits to each one of them separately, and sends it to the verifier. This is the first message. Now, the verifier is going to say, okay, I want to see whether you, know, you really committed to a three coloring. I'm going to pick a random edge in this graph, and I'm going to ask you to uh, reveal the colors uh, incident on uh, this edge. So as we said, commitments have this property. They are hiding as such. When I see these things, they are just a sealed envelope. I don't know anything. But then later, when I ask the prover to open it, it cannot cheat. Whatever it sent me in the first round, it better reveal exactly what was committed in these things. So the verifier is going to say, I'm going to pick a, a random edge in this graph and ask the prover to open um, the coloring of uh, the nodes incident on this edge. So the prover does this, and then the verifier is happy as long as, as long as these colors are different. Remember, if it's a valid three coloring, no edge can be incident on uh, nodes of the same color. OK, so this is the proof system. So the verifier accepts if both the colors uh, are valid and distinct, okay, and rejects otherwise. So this is a zero knowledge proof system, and let's see why. I mean, first, completeness. Completeness holds because um, the prover has a valid coloring. It will honestly commit to the colors. It will relabel the colors and honestly give these uh, uh, colors in the commitments. When the verifier opens any edge, the edge is going to be incident on nodes with valid colorings and distinct. Okay. And soundness, on the other hand, holds here. If I start with a graph that is not three colorable, then it must be the case that no matter what coloring the prover gives me at, uh, in, the, in the first step, there must be at least one edge that, is, that, doesn't, that have the same color. Okay? Well, either the prover is going to try to commit to garbage, or if it did commit to like valid colorings, but you know, some edge must have the same two colors. Okay? And since the verifier picks a random edge when it challenges the prover, there is a 1 over e, 1 over the number of edges probability with which it's going to catch. So the soundness of this proof system is 1 minus 1 over e. OK? And zero knowledge, what do we have to do in zero knowledge? Well, you need to construct sort of a simulator that can simulate this, uh, this view. Now, recall that the simulator does not have uh, the, the valid three coloring, and it still needs to generate the view. And the idea, roughly speaking, is going to be that the simulator is going to guess the edge that the verifier uh, is going to ask, and it's going to build a commitment scheme such that at least this edge that I guessed has different colors. Okay? And just hopes that the verifier picks this edge. Now, that seems unreasonable. The probability that I'm going to win is going to be small. So it's not clear that I can do it. But the power that the simulator has here is that it is trying to show that some verifier does not learn anything more. It can actually rewind the verifier. So what the simulator is going to do is it's going to just keep trying. It's going to guess what edge the verifier picks. And it's going to make a commitment so that these two colorings are um, on that edge is different and hope that the verifier asks this. Since these commitments are hiding, 
the verifier cannot base its decision based on these commitments. The verifier will not know where the simulator, quote unquote, has cheated. So in this sense, the, the simulator, as I said, is going to guess which edge the verifier picks, is going to cheat in the commitments on that edge, and hope that the verifier asks this edge. And if it doesn't, it's just going to try all over again. And now you can ask, well, you need the simulator to be polynomial time. How many times do I have to rewind? Since the verifier cannot guess exactly what I'm doing, in expectation, my um, simulator needs to run uh, order edges number of times until it, uh, it hits the guess that the verifier is going to ask with, uh, um, correctly. Okay. Again, all of this can be formalized. I'm sort of giving you a high level of how one actually constructs a simulator for, uh, for this scheme. But as I mentioned, I wanted to ask you, why, why was it necessary that you needed to permute these colors before the prover commits? Anyone? Yes? Do a bunch of rounds, then and eventually you'll get all the colors. Right. So uh, it's not just that, but also that I mean, if I did commit to the actual coloring, you learn something about my coloring, right? So if you permute it, it is equally likely to be any two distinct colors, okay? And this also, I mean, it comes out in the simulation where the simulation needs to simulate the same behavior, but this is sort of crucial to construct the zero knowledge proof system, okay? Now, this is great. We have constructed a zero knowledge proof system for graph three coloring. We got completeness, it holds with probability one, and soundness is one minus one over E. That's a little bit uh, unsatisfying, right? One minus one over E is bad soundness. So, how do we bring this down? Well, there are standard techniques, but you can repeat this proof system uh, over and over again and bring, and bring the soundness down. You have to repeat it order e times, or a little order e times to get constant, but a little more if you want to get negligible uh, soundness. Okay, and here I'm not going to get into the detail. One could ask, can I repeat it parallelly as opposed to sequentially? And what I'm talking about here is sequentially because uh, parallelly we still don't know. It's an open problem to prove whether if I repeat it in parallel, is it zero knowledge? Okay, this is a big open question whether. Uh, when I repeat the, the zero knowledge protocol in parallel, does the soundness go down? And is it zero knowledge? Yes? So you did the permutation. Um, let's say you did this repetition. And if gra graph isomorphism was polynomial time solvable, would there be a problem? Or is, is, is that not an issue? So the, the question is that if something becomes in polynomial time, then the, the z a zero knowledge proof system is I send you nothing. Because you could learn everything on your own. I just don't need to send you anything. So it, that just becomes a trivial zero knowledge system. It's like asking, can I get a zero knowledge system for BPP? Yes? So, one comment is actually you, you may still not learn the R couple, so that you still may have something to get, right? Even if it's in polynomial time, yeah. you may be able to find the coloring, but not your color. Right. right. So you still hide something, right? Um, yes. And what's the technical difficulty with doing it in parallel? So as I said, if you look here, how do I do zero knowledge? I actually guess your edge, right. right? So and how many times do I have to rewind to guess your edge? One over edge, uh, uh, order one over edge in expectation, right? Now if I repeat it in parallel, I have to make correct guesses in all of the parallel uh, executions. Okay. So if I want negligible soundness, I'll have to repeat it at least so many times, and then my simulator becomes exponential time. So, but that does go to the point that you can achieve parallel if I allow my simulation to be exponential time. And that relates to something called witness indistinguishability, but uh, that's a weaker property than zero knowledge. OK, so here, yes? It's not a problem if the verifier is honest, or is it because the verifier is malicious that this parallel thing is not work? Yeah. Because, uh, yes, you are right. It is because the verifier, uh, we have to deal with malicious verifiers that could uh, base its decision of opening an edge on arbitrary things. This is honest verifier zero knowledge. When you repeat it in parallel, it is honest verifier zero knowledge. So for honest verifier, it's fine? Yes, for honest verifier, it is fine. All right, so 
Just a couple of things I want to point out in this thing. As I said, the computer science thing is to say, game over, I've done it for all of NP because I've done it for graph three coloring. But if you go into like, okay, really, I want to use these protocols, zero knowledge proofs in practice, one thing is that is car production. And car production to graph three coloring is going to be, no one I think I know of has ever implemented it from an arbitrary NP statement to graph three coloring. And soundness amplification is also an issue because if I, I don't want one minus one over E soundness, I want negligible soundness, which means I'll have to sequentially repeat this order E times, and this is also not good uh, in practice. Okay? So now what I'm going to do is, so this is zero knowledge for all of NP, and now I'm going to give you another way of constructing zero knowledge for all of NP, which are going to help address some of these and give you much more richer kind of zero knowledge uh, proof systems. So this is zero knowledge via secure uh, multi-party computation. So before I get into this construction, I have to tell you what is secure multi-party computation. So bear with me for uh, a few slides. I want to tell you what secure computation is, okay? So what is secure computation? Well, secure computation allows a set of parties, P1 through Pn, that each individually have private inputs X1 through uh, Xn, and they all want to learn some function jointly over their private inputs in such a way that they learn only the output and nothing else, okay? So, I've been talking to a few people about you know, this MPC technology in practice, and often what I say is that zero knowledge helps protecting privacy when you have only one, uh, one entity that has a privacy requirement, but when you want privacy for multiple parties, you sort of need secure computation. So in secure computation, what you have is you have a set of parties, each having their own private sensitive information, and they want to jointly compute functions over their inputs, over their sensitive inputs. You can, if you want to have a simplified picture, you can imagine they all have the same function, okay? And a classic example that people talk about here is auctions, okay? You have people bidding, they don't want to reveal their bid, and the function that you want to compute is the person with the highest bid, okay? And you want a protocol where these parties can compute this function just within themselves, where they learn the output and nothing else. And this is exactly what secure computation facilitates. So how does one formalize secure computation? I'm going to give you a one slide sort of thing. The way you do it is by comparing what happens in a real world with what happens in an ideal world. So the first step in defining secure computation is sort of to define what you think you would, what sort of security properties would you like in an ideal world. And the way it's usually formalized is by saying that there is some trusted entity that receives the input from all parties and then does the computation correctly and reveals the answer, okay? This is what you want ideally, okay? And you want to say that what happens in the real world is as correct and as private as the ideal world. In other words, I first define an ideal world with all my security requirements, and in my ideal world, you know, it doesn't exist, but I can say that I have a trusted party that does all the computations correctly and keeps the information private, okay? So I want a real world protocol between the parties that is as correct and as private as the ideal world. So the way you formally define this is to say that this protocol protects against all adversaries in the real world, such that for every adversary in the real world, I can show that there is an adversary, let's call this adversary the simulator in the ideal world, that can carry out the same attack. You can already see the flavor here, it's similar to zero knowledge in some sense. So what, this, what the definition of secure computation is saying is that a protocol is considered secure if you can provide a mechanism that for every adversary in the real world that is trying to attack your protocol, there is an equivalent ideal adversary or adversary in the ideal world that can launch the same attack. If you can provide such a reduction, then your protocol is secure in the sense that you already defined what are the set of attacks that are possible in the ideal world. You said this is ideally what I want in here, 
And now you show that the set of attacks that an adversary can do on your protocol in the real world is restricted to the attacks that can be done in the ideal world. Okay? And I should point out that here, the, the attacks in the ideal world, I mean, there are attacks that you can do in the ideal world. If I go and hack this person, I can in fact change the input of this person. Okay? And this we consider as legitimate. So in secure computation, this is not necessarily protected. Okay, and what is also not protected is what the function itself reveals. Okay, so these are two aspects that are sort of orthogonal to what secure computation uh, gives over here. For example, if the function itself reveals some part of your input, it's not like a secure computation can protect against it. Okay, so you define what function you want to learn, and then a secure computation can deliver the security that everyone will learn exactly what this function computes and nothing more. Okay, so this is secure computation in a slide. And now what we want to talk about is can we construct zero knowledge from secure computation? And I want to say that all these like wonderful things, zero knowledge proofs, and there were many works in multi-party computation dubbed as MPC over here um, in the 80s. And the question sort of here is are these things in fact related? Okay. Um, I want to point out that both zero-knowledge proofs and multi-party computation have different flavors that I'm not going into. For example, as uh, uh, Alessandro said, there are proofs versus arguments. You can talk about um, the, the you can talk about security against an unbounded prover versus security against an unbounded verifier. And similarly, even in MPC, there are all these flavors. Computational says that the security you achieve at the end of the day is not against unbounded uh, adversaries, but only bounded adversaries. You can talk about, in a, in a multi-party setting, you can talk about how many parties can my adversary attack. Okay? And there are two distinct classes here, honest majority and dishonest majority. Honest majority says that an adversary can, at any point of time, corrupt or hack less than half of the parties, okay? And dishonest majority says the adversary can corrupt up to all but one of the, uh, of the parties. Now, there's also a third kind here where you can get, um, okay, so this dichotomy is also important from uh, an assumptions point of view. So for honest majority uh, MPC, one can actually construct this without any cryptographic assumptions. Like I said, for zero knowledge, you need one-way functions. Here in the unconditional regime, there are uh, situations where I can construct these protocols without any cryptographic assumptions. But <coughs> if I want to construct something beyond honest majority, which means the adversary can corrupt all but one of these parties, I necessarily have to use uh, assumptions. Okay, I have to use some form of cryptographic assumption to do this. With one exception here being, this is a model that sort of helps you abstract things out. You can actually get unconditional MPC, meaning security against unbounded adversaries, if every pair of party have access to what we call an ideal oblivious transfer oracle. Okay. I'm just going to do a very quick word. This is not going to be relevant. If you don't know, it's fine. What is an oblivious transfer oracle? You should. Oh, I had a picture. I lost my picture. Never mind. Maybe I can quickly tell you what is uh, an oblivious transfer oracle. It is if I have two parties, I'm going to call S and R. S has two inputs, S0 and S1, and R has a bit B. And every pair of party have an access to what we call an oblivious transfer oracle that takes us input S0 and S1 from S that we call the sender and B that we call from the receiver and gives S B. It is sort of an ideal object that implements something like a multiplexer. Okay? So if every pair of party have, uh, parties have access to such an oracle, that can ideally perform this uh, functionality, then we can actually get uh, unconditional uh, multi-party computation in this world. Okay? This is just an abstraction that helps us develop protocols. It is not like in, in, when we actually implement this protocol that there is someone who will, who will do this. 
OK, so why did I get into all of these is because I want to talk about how to construct zero knowledge proofs from multi-party computation. <laughs> okay. So first, there is an obvious way of constructing zero knowledge from uh, secure multi-party computation. As I said before, zero knowledge is like situations where only one party is private. In secure computation, it's where multiple parties are, uh, have you know, privacy requirements. You can just think of zero knowledge as an instance of secure computation. So think of two parties, their inputs are uh, it's x comma w for the prover, x for the verifier, and the output is basically the, um, the output of the relation on the prover's input. I mean, you can also just uh, do a little bit, check that this is the statement x, and that this is uh, the, the relation uh, x on w outputs 1. Okay, so here is a simple way of constructing, if you give me a secure computation protocol for all functions, instantiate secure computation with this function, and you get a zero knowledge proof system. This is very easy, okay? But what is the problem with this? Well, as I mentioned to you before, um, you need a secure computation protocol for two parties. Now, secure computation for two parties necessarily has to be in the dishonest majority setting. You are not going to get an honest majority with two people. You need at least three or more parties, which means that these protocols will require cryptographic assumptions. And if I instantiate zero knowledge in this approach, I'm going to inherit all the assumptions that were required for secure computation. And secure computation also requires more assumptions than uh, zero knowledge. Just to make sort of a distinction, zero knowledge can be done from symmetry key primitives. Like one-way functions, hash functions are enough to do zero knowledge. But secure computation in this regime requires public key assumptions. Okay? So instantiating this way is going to make us inherit all these, uh, these assumptions as well as the inefficiencies of secure computation. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider a different approach that's going to give us uh, much better features. Okay? So the idea here is going to be to, the goal is we want to construct a zero knowledge proof for some relation. Now, we're going to consider an MPC, uh, a multi-party computation for this bizarre functionality. What is this functionality? It is an n-party uh, functionality where it takes inputs from n parties. It takes w1 through wn from the n parties. It adds them up and evaluates the relation and reveals this. Okay, so it's essentially the relation slightly modified. Okay, so we are going to consider a multi-party computation for this function, where n parties supply their inputs and the, the, the multi-party computation gives you the evaluation of the relation on this. X, okay? X is given to everybody too. X is given to uh, everybody. X is public. Now, what are the security features that we will need uh, in, on the multi-party computation? Actually, very, very minimal. Okay? You want it to be too secure, meaning that uh, it's enough to consider an MPC where the adversary corrupts at most two parties. Okay? The, more, the more number of parties that you corrupt, the MPC gets more complicated. So if I just want security up to two corruptions, this is, this is like really minimal. And the MPC protocol ne needs to be secure in what we call, this is yet another flavor of MPC, where we talk about security against adversaries that follow the protocol, as opposed to adversaries that don't follow the protocol. This is called semi-honest security, where I only care about adversaries that will, you know, they're just honest but curious. They are going to corrupt parties, look at what's happening, and try to learn more. Okay, so I need an MPC protocol for this function G that is too secure, that is secure just against semi-honest adversaries, and honest majority is fine. I get the flexibility of choosing what N will be, but if I want honest majority and two security, the number of parties I need to handle is at least four, at least five. Okay, so I'm gonna show how to construct. What is semi-honest again? Semi-honest says that I just need to show that my protocol is private against adversaries that can corrupt whatever threshold set of parties that you, uh, you, you set. 
But it will follow the protocol honestly. It will not deviate from, it's not Byzantine in that sense. And you just want sort of privacy. If you saw, if you recall in the. It corrupts just inputs. So it, not, no inputs also. It doesn't corrupt anything. Like. It doesn't do anything. It, will... it can still try to, so I mean, uh, it's still non trivial to construct against that adversaries because you need privacy against those parties. Right? Like you're saying that, look, I'm constructing this protocol against these parties that if I see two or three of them, maybe I learn everything. So even if it follows the protocol, there is something non-trivial to be shown in these things. But it is barely minimal. Like, this is like very minimal requirements on uh, the MPC protocol. And I also want to sort of say that this can be constructed unconditionally. I don't need any assumptions for uh, this setting. And for people who know something like BGW, like this is like uh, even passive BGW is something that's uh, enough to instantiate uh, this uh, MPC protocol. Okay. So. Let's take an MPC protocol that is too secure, um, perfectly correct, and I'll tell you why we need perfectly correct, and then I'll tell later how this can be relaxed. Um, perfectly correct essentially says that there isn't bad randomness that if these parties somehow choose, they will get the incorrect answer. So perfect correctness just rules out this case. Okay. So now this is sort of the punchline. If you forgot, if you didn't listen to anything in this talk, I'm going to show how to construct a zero knowledge proof system from MPC. And uh, this was done in, in the beautiful work of uh, Ishai Koshilovitz, Ostrowski, and Sahai. I think it was in 2007. The journal version was 2009. Okay, so the goal construct zero knowledge for this relation. Consider this modified functionality that does a slightly different thing before it computes the relation. So, what is the proof system? We have a prover. The prover in her head is going to simulate the execution of this MPC protocol. In particular, what it's going to do, it's going to consider n parties, it's going to distribute, take W and then break it into W1 through Wn, give it as input to these parties P1 through Pn, and emulate this MPC in her head, okay? Meaning just you know, run the uh, next message algorithm of uh, each one of these parties in her head and you know, sort of just collect the log of this entire execution. Then what the prover is going to do, well, the prover is going to let vi be the view of pi. And view basically is the transaction log from my point of view if I was participating in the protocol. And if you want a little more precisely, it is all the messages I exchanged in the protocol and my input and randomness that I used. So these okay. WIs are just random reconstruction of the W. <coughs> Sorry? The WIs are, the only constraint is the XOR. Yes. And so the prover does this, and then now takes the view of each of these parties, and the first message, you're going to see now the parallel to graph three coloring, but it, the prover is going to commit to the views of each of these parties, okay? Now the verifier is going to take and is going to challenge to open a couple of these commitments. It's going to pick two i and j from the set of parties and ask open these up, okay? And the prover will um, decommit or open the messages committed in v i and v j. What's the verifier going to do? It's going to check consistency between these two. It's going to check two things. It's going to check whether the output of the computation was one. This is important because I need to know that the relation turned out to be one. That's the whole goal. I want to make sure that uh, the relation on x comma w, there exists a w such that the relation on x comma w is one. And it's going to check if the view of vi and vj are consistent. What does this mean? The messages sent from vi was logged correctly in both vi and vj. The messages exchanged between these two parties. And if these two conditions hold, the verifier accepts. Okay. And this is the zero knowledge proof system. Let's just quickly see completeness will hold because if the relation is true on this witness, then it's easy for the prover to emulate this multi-party computation. And you know, to get this, this is called the XOR sharing, but it's easy to get random W1 through Wn such that they add up to W. You just pick N, y, N minus one of them at random and make the last one the difference of W and the sum. Okay, so the prover can do this. All the views are consistent because the prover emulated the MPC correctly, which means no matter which two uh, i and j the, the, the verifier picks, the prover will be able to decommit it correctly. 
Okay? Now, soundness, on the other hand, is going to be 1 minus 1 over n choose 2. 1 minus 1 over n square. And roughly, the point is that if, if the statement was not true, then it means that there is no set of w1 through wn that will make this output 1. Which means that no matter what the prover tries to do, there must be some two of these parties that are inconsistent. Okay, you cannot generate a view that is going to output this. And here is where you're going to use perfect correctness. There is no way in which you can set up these input and randomness for parties to make a wrong answer. Okay, so no matter what the prover submits, there has to be two views for which this uh, uh, it's not going to be consistent according to the MPC protocol, and the probability with which the verifier is going to catch that is one over and choose two. Okay. So that's soundness. And zero knowledge, and here, uh, again, at least when I read this, this is the beautiful part. Zero knowledge is typically hard to you know, uh, do in these settings. Here, the zero knowledge aspect actually follows from the simulation of the MPC. Okay? What does a multi-party computation give? Multi-party computation says for every adversary in the real world, there is a simulator in the ideal world that can sort of simulate the views of the adversary. So, what the simulator is going to do is going to guess i comma j, and then it's going to just commit to vi and vj that are consistent. And how do I construct vi and vj that is consistent? I'll just call the simulator. Okay? And I can call the simulator to construct vi, vj, and I can do this. And this is like very similar to the graph three coloring that we saw that um, you know, I will rewind until my guess is right, and then I can simulate this. Okay? Is so everyone with me? Sort of the um, complete the, the soundness and the zero knowledge security properties of the zero knowledge system follows in some sense directly from the properties of the MPC protocol. Okay? But then you know I did all this and then finally I still get something like really the soundness is not good. I sort of like did a huge build-up saying graph three coloring has bad soundness and so forth. But uh, we're going to see how this is going to be useful, but I want to sort of point out that this is sort of a more natural way of uh, constructing a uh, zero knowledge proof system. Because constructing an MPC protocol for a function, this is something that is um, more natural than doing sort of a car production to graph three coloring. You only depend directly on the function, and when we talk about efficiency of these things, you can directly relate the efficiency of the MPC protocol to the efficiency of the zero knowledge proof system. And I would argue that it's not natural, but maybe it's more efficient. It's natural about it that you solve one big problem and then you say I reduce it to the fact that somebody already solved the problem. So it's natural in the sense, okay, well, I mean, I can give the, the technical thing is that one doesn't have to know the internals of this function, so to speak. I can just say, construct any arbitrary MPC for this function can be plugged in over here. And, so, and this is not something like all the other things really require to you know, engineer these things in some sense. Well, maybe it's not natural, matter of taste. OK. It's natural. Sorry. Or maybe ask Amit. Like. <laughs> I, would, I, would, so, uh, I don't know if it's a question of opinion. I don't think it's that. Okay. <laughs> That's great. Bring this uh, down to earth. Yes. Uh, so can you give some intuition on how the simulator can... Uh, Simulate? So, so, so you so have a desired outcome. Yeah. Which is the relation. Uh, right. Good. So uh, let me just go a little more detail. I, oh, I'm running out of time. Okay, good, good. Um, <laughs> Um, okay, so let's take that offline. I'll, I'll, I'll just sort of, I have just two more slides and uh, I'll be done with that. Okay, so I think I have only two, two more slides. Something that will come maybe more in the next talk, this is an interactive version. If you want something non-interactive, one can apply the Fiat Shamir uh, heuristic to these, uh, to these protocols. There are um, extensions. Um, as I said, this is just a framework. You can translate any MPC protocol to, uh, to zero knowledge. 
You can even, here I said I need at least two secure. You can also do one secure protocols. Uh, here you just have to commit different things. You have to commit to views and also communication channels separately, and you can consider even one secure MPC, which allows you to instantiate with other protocols. Um, you can also handle MPC with error. I sort of told you that I needed it to be perfectly correct. You can also do things that are statistically secure, and in fact, doing this helps you get better efficiency. Um, you can also do things that if the MPC protocol employs oblivious transfer, you can still use that as your, um, as your basic MPC protocol to do the zero knowledge and not inherit the assumptions required for OT. This is also possible, and you get some additional kind of features uh, for, uh, for these kind of transformations. And the last slide. Simple zero knowledge proofs you can instantiate with BGW one out of three. You can instantiate with the GMW in the OT hybrid. These are very simple zero knowledge systems that you can get. In fact, this has been implemented, and uh, even to date, for like some kind of the circuit regimes, the prover complexity of these things are much better than the things that we know of. And there have also been ca candidates for post quantum signatures that have come. Like from zero knowledge proofs, you can get digital signatures, and there have been, uh, this work actually gives, the, the last two works give post-quantum signatures from uh, this kind of uh, zero-knowledge proofs from uh, MPC in the head. You can get asymptotically efficient uh, zero-knowledge proofs. If I give you only bit commitments or one-way functions, you can ask what is the best communication complexity that we know. You can just instantiate it by giving the right MPC protocol. You can get. Uh, zero knowledge with uh, corresponding efficiency features. Um, I have some work here which uh, shows that this can actually be practically uh, efficient uh, and get sublinear proof systems. Um, you can also, this is, this is one of the nice features. Like if I want to do an MP, zero knowledge for some function that has some different representation, some different computational model, if I have the right MPC for that functionality, maybe it's over rings, maybe it's over groups, then I can instantiate that MPC to get uh, a good uh, zero knowledge system. Thanks. Are you doing sequential composition? You mentioned about soundness. Yes. So, so then you, you, it's not constant around anymore. After no. So you can. So uh, getting negligible soundness. There are there are ways to make the parallel repetition work. It loses the property of. There are multiple ways of getting it. But if you just want it from bit commitments, then you need to make it private coin, and you can make it. This is Goldrick Kahan. Like you can. Uh, construct something, even parallel repetition works, but with MPC you can do something slightly better, but it still becomes private coin. Another way to do it is get honest verifier zero knowledge and apply fiat shami. This is another way that you can get zero knowledge. You don't need to do the, uh, the sequential repetitions. Yes. No, you just make the verifier commit to the challenge and then open it. This is Goldreich Kahan. Like uh, essentially, so that's why it becomes private coin. So because then I don't have to guess. Because if the verifier commits to the challenge before the prover gives, then you know the verifier opens. I can rewind, and then now I know where to cheat. Again, it doesn't work. There's some work needs to be done there. It's not like Goldrick Kahan was like a. Yeah. Fiat yeah, Shamir doesn't always work. There are protocols for, for, for which Fiat Shamir doesn't work. Uh, ah. Like? Sorry. Like, uh, uh, like uh, uh, the original GMR converted to this. Never mind. It's, okay. it's a recent result. Ah, I see. OK. Yes. And look, can you go back to the slide with the MPC in your head? So I feel like if I were trying to design this from scratch, I'd be pretty confused at the n squared, and here's why. I think the more natural thing to do is I pick one of the PI, yeah. and just look at all the input that goes into it and its internal thinking process. Yeah. So instead of taking an edge, I like kind of take the web around a single node. Right. So the similar proof should work, right? Like mm -hmm. one of those should be incoherent. I could make it like, look, if you're saying that I open only the view of one party, like this. Honestly, give all the all the outputs to it in your mental process that are given from the other parties. So your, but that is the view, right? I mean, there is nothing more than that. What do you mean by beyond the view? That is 
I mean, the view contains incoming and outgoing messages and the input and randomness. Right, but I'm saying this way you don't have to de like decommit two. You can decompose a view and this the other channel. data set that includes the... Right, so that's how you do one secure. That is right. You could okay. do that as well, correct. But wouldn't that give you like one minus one over n? Yes, you can make that. Like with, uh, you could make it one minus one over n. But the better thing to do, but the better thing... Minutes, but like better <coughs> There are other ways, like if I consider t out of n for larger t and larger n, you can get negligible soundness in much better ways. You can directly instantiate with an MPC that has much better, you, like you can make this like one over t choose n, which will already be uh, negligible. So the, you won't uh, use this in, in practice, at least the ones that do, do the digital signatures, they instantiate it for constant number of parties and do parallel repetition. So for that, it like really like this, uh, uh, you still want to work on good soundness, but uh, for negligible soundness, there are other ways to get it. Thank you. I think let's take further questions of time. Uh, let's enjoy a break and let's uh, continue.